Um, so it's great to be here, and I'm um, having a lot of fun being back at AEM. What's new in trauma care? Obviously, you could go anywhere with that topic, uh, just about. Um, and we'll talk about some topics. That's my affiliation, my division. Um, I just got back from Madagascar and uh, saw six different types of lemurs, not six all at once like this. Uh, well, and I did see those, though. Those are little brown mouse lemurs. They're kind of cool. Um, while we fled tropical cyclone Anawa, it was not, uh, you know, being kind of, was, as the last speaker was saying, being in the developing world with uh, 18 inches of rain is not cool. No real declarations except the one at the bottom. He mentioned I worked on Code Black. You might think I got f uh, famously rich. I, I'm still 20 grand in the red, but technically I own the thing. Um, so it needs to be there um, as a declaration. Trauma care. This is an image that I always kind of think of. When I think about trauma care, you see a, a, you know, a trauma surgeon there. Um, the patient um, is uh, being aggressively resuscitated, apparently. Um, uh, you can see the two medical students up in the back. Um, they're just trying, you know, the medical students, you can always see, the medical students usually kind of going like this. You know that one vulture that just can't get in there? They're, they usually have an ABG syringe when they're doing that. Can I get in there? Um, but anyway, you know, so I always think about this in the trauma room and the hubbub that goes with it. And, you know, there's a lot to talk about in here, and not all of it's science. You might think of oh, what's new in trauma talk, would just talk about new papers and how they change our practice. And we'll do some of that, um, a fair amount actually, but not just that. I started making a list of what we could talk about. And some of the things here I'm not going to talk about, like, you know, sure, we could, Reboa is cool, we could talk about it. I just think it's done on way too few of patients to have that much info. We could talk about things like, you know, geographical information systems, the whole debate about does trauma care exist or are we acute care surgery? Massive transfusion protocol. Some of these ATLS, God knows, I, you know, I could have a seizure on that. Um, you know, trauma center CME, that's, that's actually status epilepticus if I start talking about that. So we're not going to do all those things. Some of the other things that I've highlighted in yellow here I'm going to do. I'm not Corey Slovis, cause, and you can tell because there's more than five. All right. First thing I want to talk about is uh, HEMS and Almost all of us in emergency medicine know this, that stuff that doesn't need to come by helicopters comes by helicopters. And the charges are enormous. In many systems, the patients are charged uh, upwards of $30,000. There's been a bunch of news stories, bills up into the 50s. And for a patient that's discharged from the emergency department. Um, I saw a patient recently, and I won't go into more details because it's a pretty identifiable case, of a kid who had his distal fingertip whacked off you know, index finger, you know, at, right at the DIP. I'm sure that hurt. It's going to leave a mark uh, for sure. Um, and they flew him in for replantation. I was like, no, no. He could have gone to the urgent care and gotten a, a bass of tracing in a little wrap. Um, um, and the family was all very happy that he was flown in for that because um, they thought it was very dramatic and it made it seem important, but they hadn't seen the bill yet, and I bet their insurance doesn't cover it. So there's a bunch of papers out there that look at injury severity scores and who's flown, and they all say the same thing, that very few of them go to the uh, OR. Many of them are discharged from the ER. The injury severity scores are slow, are, are generally lower than you might expect. And if we want a helicopter transport to be a benefit, we have to be selective and take sick people who might need to go to the OR or the ICU. If you come in by helicopter, discharged home with boo-boo aftercare, can't be the outcome. That just, can't, can't, you know, and if it is the outcome, then there has to be an inquisition afterwards to find out why. Um, because these things are dangerous. Whenever someone tells me that, you know, oh, we haven't had a crash in our system, that doesn't happen. No, that means they're due. That's all it means. We know about helicopters. There's no wings on them. They don't have a great glide ratio. This is a Maryland shock trauma. I give all props to uh, Mark Hershon on this. They did a huge thing where they cracked down on HEMS transports to Maryland shock trauma. A lot, a lot of what comes to MIMS comes by uh, helicopter transport. And they really just said, we got to crack. I mean, this is crazy stuff. A lot of these people come could have come well by ground and done just fine. And so he did a whole project where they increased online control. They eliminated some of the mechanism of, of injury transports, right? Because we all know that a mechanism of injury tends to lead to over triage in trauma systems, 
Right? We all know that the mechanism, PSI, for example, passenger space intrusion, is a notoriously bogus reason to be brought to a trauma center. You won't have much if that's the only thing you got. And so they did this, and it was an excellent way. They decreased the number of flights and dispatches a lot in a very multidisciplinary fashion, and all credit to them, um, because you've got to control the boys and the toys. Many of these air ambulances are nothing more than a way to generate TV coverage for the trauma center. And we just have to tell the truth about it. That's what it is. The other thing I would talk about that's new in trauma, and this is really new for me because I've changed from L.A. County, um, uh, which is an inner city, indigent uh, hospital that had an average age of hospitalization in the 50s, to Stony Brook, which is an older suburban population. On You know, they come in on 25 meds. I can't tell you how many patients I see at Stony Brook there are medications I've never heard of. They're all on some what the fuck you mab thing. I don't even know what it is. They're, they're all on multiple anticoagulants. Um, and, you know, when, they're, when you're old and you've got 10 doctors and then 10 doctors don't talk to each other, they all put you on two medicines. The end is 20 medica- medications. And then you, you know, you, I wonder why she fell. Uh, you know, it's probably the medications in some cases. But elderly trauma... I have really been amazed at how different, I mean, I saw old people with trauma before, but when, you're, when I'm in this community at Stony Brook, you really do see how different it is. Um, obviously, vital signs can be very misleading. Um, they're, all, they're frail. They're potato chips. Um, they don't do well. The dreaded ground-level fall, I mean, if I fall down, you know, you would, you would say to me something along the lines of, Billy, good fall, get up, shake it off. These people fall down. They've got three rib fractures, a ruptured spleen. They've got a pulmonary contusion. Um, it's really impressive. A hip fracture. A lot of, of their workup, plain films don't go. And while I am not a pan-scan advocate, more on that in a moment, this is a group that I've been shocked at what we find when we work them up in that fashion. So the elderly epidemics, obviously, we're an aging population. Uh, Japan is the fastest aging population as a country. Chile, where I've done a bunch of work over the last uh, 20 years, is, is in the top 10. United States is up there as well. And it just means that for us as emergency docs, we're going to have to get really used to this. So here's some other data. Talk about traumatic brain injuries. You know, they bump the cabinet with their head. It's lethal. You bump the cabinet on your head, you can plunk a cabinet. Who left it open? You know, but these people have significant injury patterns. When you look at this MMWR report and this steady initiative, the Stopping Elderly Accidents, Death, and Injuries, what they find is, is that traumatic brain injuries, you know, you think, when you think trauma and traumatic brain injuries, you're thinking a young kid smacked with a baseball or someone who fell off. A, no, it's old people who came in with no known baseline mental status, who are a little bit confused, Maybe they're on a novel oral anticoagulant or aspirin or all of it together, and they end up with bad, bad outcomes. Um, We're also learning that, uh, you know, when grandma goes down and she's got a hip fracture, what's the goal? What's the medical goal? Fix it for sure, but get her up. Get her up. If she stays in bed for more than a few days, then that's the beginning of the end. And so we know that hip fracture outcomes are about this. And one of the things we've learned recently is, is that there's new treatments in the pelvic ring. We didn't used to do anything. We didn't care about sacral fractures. We never did much for them. But we found out that these people just can't get up if they have them. Um, and so sacral fractures are of increasing importance. This is new in trauma. There's new transsacral bars, percutaneous transsacral pins. And repair of the sacrum is very important in terms of these people's ability to get up and out of bed. There's a percutaneous transsacral screw. Because um, you have to stabilize this. It's just not going to knit together in a 75-year-old, and it will prevent her from getting up. This is a little debate that's been going on, talking about... You know, we, we do the, the teapot and we bind up the pelvis so they don't bleed to death if they've got a pelvic fracture. With bad pelvic fractures, you know, the bleeding is often ongoing. It's usually venous. It's usually posterior. And the question is, um, should we be taking some of these to the OR? And there's an ongoing debate in the trauma world about taking them for um, pelvic packing directly as opposed to doing things like teapot and other interventions that are more conservative. And the reason I put this up is because it's one of the reasons to go to the OR. I would suspect that many an emergency physician in this room has been in the emergency department was for several hours with a trauma patient watching the hemoglobin drop despite your efforts to transfuse them, ongoing resuscitation, watching it drop, recover, drop, drop. 
And, um, you know, those patients do very, very badly. Hemorrhaging to death from pelvic fractures is still the main cause of death. And so I offer this paper because sometime we've got to ask them to take them to the OR. And, that will, and it does better, by the way, than angio does. Occult hip fractures, we all know about these. Um, there are about uh, multiple, multiple studies say the incidence is about 4% in the elderly. That's 1 in 25. Um, I've seen them, and even in some young people. And generally speaking, a CT is good enough. But if you had both CT and MRI, which would you do? This is a paper by Greg Hendy et al. that looked at it. And MRI was better. MRI found fractures that CT missed. Not many, but it did. And it also found a lot of other pathology. That's really the first good head-to-head -head comparison of CT and MRI when you're looking for occult hip fractures. So fine, get, get a CT if that's what you've got, but if all things being equal and you have an MRI available for you, you would go for the MRI, or should, I think. Let's talk a little bit more about imaging, and this is one of my favorite phrases, vomit, victim of medical imaging technology. And who here thinks, just, just by a show of hands, you only have to put up one hand, who thinks that the trauma surgical community is addicted to the CT scanner? I mean, people can have a stubbed toe, they're going to get pan scanned in some places. I mean, it's gotten ridiculous. The radiation exposures are large, and we could talk about the various ways of dealing with this addiction, and I will. Uh, first, the first thing I want to show is this paper. It's not a trauma paper at all. It's a cardiology paper from McGill where they measured the cards work up, you know, they get their persantine scans and et cetera, et cetera, and they added up their their radiation exposures and millisieverts, and then they compared them to a cohort without radiation, and then they followed them for cancers. Why is this paper so important? This paper is so important because one of the things you hear all the time, yeah, these lifetime adjusted risks of cancer, they're all mumbo jumbo fantasy calculations out into the future. Where are the actual cancers? Oh, no, this is the actual cancers. They actually measured the actual cancers. This is not, we're not sure, we think the lifetime. No, they found the cancers, and they started appearing earlier than we think. Even in the next five years, 3% for every 10 millisieverts. So that's kind of an interesting 3% increase in risk. I, I, don't, I, I don't want to misstate it, otherwise you'd get the wrong idea. So the baseline risk may be low, but it goes up. And so this is a real thing. They actually measured them. They were finding them. And trauma patients are frequently getting, this is 3% increase for every 10 millisieverts. Why is this relevant? Some people with medical radiation say that there's the hockey stick. Do you know the hockey stick argument? You know that you can have a low level exposure of radiation and your risk of disease doesn't go up. And then it eventually goes up. So they're, they're, that's the hockey stick argument. That medical radiation and some of these things at low levels is, a, you know, it's a free shot. No. There's nothing that suggests that. Um, I think all the data says there is no hockey stick. It just goes up. It's additive. It's cumulative. It just goes up. So, yeah, CT is better at imaging, right? I don't do skull films anymore. Neither do you. Plain films, I still think there's a role for them in appropriately selected patients uh, when you talk about the neck. The chest CT is particularly bad in a pan scan because there are breasts underneath it. The neck is particularly bad because of the thyroid. So if you wanted to do things, you would try and spare the chest and spare the thyroid. That would, those would be the highest money yield in terms of decreasing cancer exposure. Um, and so we can talk a little bit about that, and we'll talk about it. These are trauma patient measurements in Toronto and Sunnybrook. They just added up all their radiation. The CAT scans were 86% of their total radiation exposure, and 22% got over 100 millisieverts at the thyroid. Ouch. Ouch. We, we know that, they're, that the age of the patient and the gender is very important. This is a Medscape quote that says that we're going wild with CT scan and we've got to stop doing it. Um, this is, notice, no hockey stick, no hockey stick shape on that. Um, age and gender matters, but it matters in ways that are kind of obvious in some cases, but not obvious in others. Like, I, it's pretty clear. If you do a CT coronary angiogram on a 40-year-old woman, then you're going to increase her risk of breast cancer. It's a direct hit to a radiation-sensitive tissue. And so women are going to have much more risk than men from that same, because that's one of the main cancers you're talking about. But how many of you would think that thyroid cancer has a big gender variation? It does. And so girls, if you took pediatric patients and, thyro and, and CT their necks, the girls are going to get twice as many cancers as the men, as the boys. 
So even in other places where I don't think of gender as being that important. So this is, in fact, in trauma care, it's a women's health issue in many cases. Because I think that a, a negative chest x-ray, a negative chest ultrasound, adequate auscultation, and not much in the way of chest sy symptoms, do I really need a CT scan of the chest in that patient? I'll give you the abdomen pelvis. I'll give you the head and neck. But maybe we could back off on some of the chests. And this is just Adam Baum survivorship just reminding us that when you look at all the data that talks about why people die from radiation and what we know about it, we know a lot about it. So the people who say to you from the trauma world, ah, we don't know, it's all sort of estimates and guesses, we know from multiple sources. We got the biological effects of ionizing radiation, anatomic phantom data, Hiroshima excess death data, which I just showed you on the last one. People are still dying in Hiroshima from the atomic bomb. They're old people now. Um, <clears throat> we know that radiation is cumulative. There's no hockey stick. All this we don't know. It's speculative stuff that you hear. I don't know. They got a trauma problem now. No, this is real stuff and we can do better. And I'm going to talk about some of the ways that are out there that we can do better. One thing we can do is stop relighting up the transfers. I mean, can we not make these computers compatible? How many times do you get a disk from another hospital and you can't load it? We have to fix that. That's unacceptable technological reasons to rescan someone. But in many of these studies, the repeat C-scan is happening three quarters of the time. That's preposterous. We could do better. We can do other things. The as low as reasonably achievable strategy means that when you change how much radiation they're getting based on body habitus. But many centers don't do this on a fluid and dynamic basis based on the patient they're about to scan. We have to do better. Um, you know, so pan scan really is happening. Here's a couple of papers that are uh, talk about it. Harm ignored in peds trauma. There you see 4.4 fold excess uh, thyroid cancer deaths, 41.4 excess breast cancer deaths. I mean, the numbers are, are not cool. They imply to me that if you have a child who's thinking of going into medicine right now, hemonk, baby. Recommend your child go into hemonk. And someday they will look back on these years of pan scanning frenzy as, you know, the cancer explosion to follow, because it's coming. And we can do better technologically, too. Do you, who knows what this thing is? This whole body, anyone got one of these? We got one at County, here it is, it's the stat scan. The stat scan will get you an AP and lateral, the whole body with enough detail to find most fractures with less radiation exposure than a chest x-ray. What's happening here? So there it is. How does this happen? Well, because if you have diamonds, they're kind of pricey. You have, every once in a while you have to find out who's stealing diamonds from the mine. So you have to be able to radiate them. But your occupational health exposure won't let you do that indiscriminately. So De Beers is the people who figured out have this low radiation exposure beam. You know, because when diamonds are at stake, someone will figure it out. So there you go. De Beers developed the technology for that imaging so they could x-ray people coming out of the diamond mines, find out what they were taking with them. And there's other things. Here's eight parameters of CT scanning that can be manipulated. This is a journal, American College of... Uh, radiology talking about how much better we can do. And then there's new stuff in the software that's very interesting. So I think that emergency medicine, as one of the main specialties involved in trauma care, needs to advocate for moving this technology aggressive faster. Because I don't think we're going to break our surgeons of the addiction to scanning. We can fight against various parts of the scan, like the chest CT or the lower part of the neck. You can have high neck protocols for kids, for example. <coughs> I just don't think it's going to work, so I think the money's here. Let's look at adaptive, um, this, this software stuff, and this will decrease dose from the scanner from pretty reliably a quarter to 30 percent, and in some cases even much higher. So I think we need to push hard for integration of these technologies and move faster with that to get the radiation down from pan scanning. This is one of the high C-spine protocols for kids. We know that 90% of the broken necks are kid are in C1, C2. 90%. So why don't we just image C1 and C2? And that's what they're saying here. Go down to C3, maybe down to C4, and you'll spare the thyroid. I showed you the thyroid excess death data, 
and the increases in thyroid cancers. So maybe we ought to protect the kids. You got a you got an eight year old that needs a, a head and a neck CT. Maybe the next CT should only go down to C3, C4. I've asked how our trauma surgeons would feel about doing this, and they're not having any of it. But still, is it reasonable? I think so. There's a couple papers. All right, traumatic aortic rupture. I remember the days when most traumatic aortic ruptures died in the field, and they still do. And the unfortunate ones that didn't die in the field were brought to us in emergency medicine where they proceeded to die in the emergency room because you couldn't mobilize what was necessary to get either a midline sternotomy or a left thoracotomy done with the thoracic, cardiothoracic surgeons there to do it. And so many of these patients died. You know all the data. They have the tear. Where is it? It's at the isthmus with ligamentum arteriosum. It's a deceleration injury. You know, remember the difference between dissection and traumatic aortic rupture. If this is my aorta right there, see the, see the rainbow? It's like a Skittles ad. Feel the rainbow. The difference is that the injury is predominantly on the inside of the rainbow in trauma and on the outside of the rainbow in dissection. They can go all the way across. But what's changed in trauma care recently, what's new, is they're stenting them. And they're surviving. And they're doing well. And so new stenting stuff is all there. So traumatic aortic ruptures, they're getting saved now. So now the deal, when you have one of those, you need to know who you're calling. Is it interventional radiology? Is it vascular surgery? Who's doing this? And these people do well. Here's a little summary paper talking about excellent outcomes. Not huge, right? How can a study like this be huge? You don't see them every day. So that's a pretty big study, actually. I also know that one of the things that you're going to see now is that what's the long-term outcome and viability of these patients that have had stented aortas? What am I talking about? Here's a patient. I'm not going to get into the details because the JDs are involved. Um, but uh, he came in, he was playing basketball, and suddenly he fell to the ground with leg weakness, and he pooped in the ambulance on the way in. That doesn't sound good to me. I was feeling well enough to play basketball, suddenly collapsed, can't move my legs well, pooped in the ambulance. So anyone, everyone focused in on his back and all of that, and he ultimately got an MR of his back, which didn't show anything on his back, but late on the attending staff read, there's like, yeah, there's nothing wrong with the back, but there is this dissection going down his lower aorta that we see that was from his stent, taking off the arterial supply to his um, spinal cord, and this was a stent-related complication. We're going to start seeing people. And no one suspected it because, yes, he had been a major trauma survivor. They had the history. Oh, yeah, he had trauma. He was in a bad car accident. Oh, you can see over here he got a chest tube, but it doesn't look like he got a laparotomy or any major surgeries. And, you know, what did the kid know? He didn't know they did something to his aorta. So no one really considered it until um, too late with rhabdo and a bunch of other bad things happening. All right, what else is new? Let's talk about thromb um, TXA, transexamic acid. So transexamic acid, cheap. It's a little, it's an amino acid for God's sake. It sits at the bottom, right? Remember the coagulation pathway? You know, intrinsic, extrinsic, common final pathway. Anytime you use a drug that works on that Y, what do you know about that drug? Any drug on the Y. The novel oral anticoagulants, warfarin, any, any of those things. Those drugs have bad complication protocol, uh, um, bad complication rates and serious complications. If you make you too clotty, you turn into a bowl of jello. If you make you too runny, you have major bleeding. All of those drugs have narrow therapeutic indices. That are, uh, but TX, uh, tranexamic acid is not on the Y. It's just after my feet. Right? It's not part of the common final pathway. Not in, So it's safer, and it uh, treats and manages hyper fibrinolysis as a state associated with surgery, uh, with trauma. Here's CRASH-2. You all know about it. It was a weird trial, modest benefit. The good thing about it was safety was shown. It's cheap as stink, um, and it really wasn't taken up that much. There were lots of, of criticisms of this thing. The secondary outcomes are there. One of the things about it was the ran it was so weird because a lot of it was done in India and elsewhere, and so the randomization protocol depended on whether your hospital had a phone. You got to ask: Is this is a hospital without a phone giving the same kind of trauma care as a hospital in London? I think they're probably a little different. So there were lots of criticisms of it, but I, the Matters trial came on later on, and it showed benefit. 
And we're now learning, I've been managing wounds that won't stop bleeding, nose bleeds, dental extraction bleeding. I had a person bleeding from a fungating mass in their airway. We couldn't get the bleeding to stop. He was a palliative care patient, right? Do you think ENT wanted to come in for that patient? It's not a trauma patient, but bleeding, spraying blood out his trach. Turned the room, the treatment room, into a red Dalmatian. Do you think radiology want to deal with? No, they were like, well, well, yeah, well, maybe we'll get the radi, you know, we'll see if we could, you know, pledge it something. I don't know. Anyway, so no one seemed very enthusiastic about this guy with this advanced cancer palliative care. So we just nebbed him some tranexamic acid. Stopped. It was nice. He was very happy. He actually went home. I mean, he was in a palliative care setting, but there you go. Here's that airway bleeding case. It was kind of cute. I had the resident take the pictures and all that. We said, uh, of course, we sent it to the annals. What did they say? That's why you can see which journal it ends up in there, palliative medicine, journal palliative medicine. We said to the analyst, they said, well, all bleeding stops. How do you know the tranexamic acid made it happen? I'm like, he was bleeding for an hour and a half. It wouldn't stop. Then we sprayed the shit down his throat and it stopped. It seemed like cause and effect. <laughs> so they rejected it. So yeah, for, the, for you budding scientists, this is the answer. You just sent it to a different journal. So I had someone with a little palliative care angle added to it. By the way, that journal, the Journal of Palliative Medicine, has a higher impact factor than the annals. So, <laughs> mock you. <laughs> so when I think about things, about this, there's a lot going on in trauma. One of the things that's been getting a little attention, and you might not even be aware of it in the emergency department, but the trauma activation fees, right? If we make our trauma activation levels low and the trauma surgeons want them to be low because they need the numbers to justify their existence. You'll never hear the cops say we fixed the crime problem because then you won't fund them. That's why all the news involving the cops is there are gangs in your backyard right now. Because if they scare the bejesus out of you, you'll think that the cops are really important. So the, the news from the cops, it's the same kind of thing here. They want all these patients to be in trauma. They don't, they don't want to talk about it. But look at the fees. I think there's an ethical problem here. Um, you know, the, I understand that trauma is, a, is sort of an unfunded mandate in many ways, and I get that. But I'm not sure trauma activation is the way to fix that with these kinds of fees. It just, especially if the patient's going home. Imagine you go to a trauma center for a whacked-off finger. You got $50,000 for the helicopter. Then they said charge you at Loma Linda sixty-four thousand for just for activation. That's not care. And then you get sent home with an evaluation and management level three emergency physician charge. So the emergency doc's gonna get like two hundred and sixty-five dollars. But you're gonna get charged this for the activation and then the other charges for the for the helicopter. That's just not right, I don't think. I think we have to address this. We need to be part of this conversation. And understand it, that if you're working at a level one or a level two, you know, you need to know what they're charging for trauma activations. A little bit about ketamine. We used to think ketamine bad, brain, I introduced it to cranial pressure, no role in trauma. God forbid, if you gave ketamine to a trauma patient, their head would just go, poof, pur you know, the purple smoke would come out, that'd be it. And then we learned, well, not so much. There have been some papers looking at the ICP. It actually lowers it in some cases. Then we learned this stuff. This is about the, this seesaw at the top of the slide that's neuroprotective and neuroinjurious. And it turns out ketamine sounds like it's probably neuroprotective. You can give it for seizures, stop seizures. I've done that a couple of times. Everyone looks at me weird when I use ketamine for a status patient. They're like, what's wrong with him? The pediatricians at L.A. County actually wanted to write me up because I use ketamine on this patient with West syndrome. It's one of those pediatric encephalopathic seizure syndromes. The kid was already trached. kid had been in status for an hour when they arrived at the emergency room, had been seen in the hospital just two days ago. I had, I had anti-epileptic levels of five meds all in the upper limit of uh, high or over. And I'm like, yeah, so why would I try one of those? They're obviously not working. So I gave him ketamine. He stopped right away. The pediatricians thought it was a very cavalier and nasty maneuver done by a, a grossly inconsiderate emergency physician. The patient eventually was admitted to the ICU where he started to seize again. They let him seize for three hours where they trialed other bullshit and finally went, oh, we'll have to give him ketamine again. It seemed to work last time. <laughs> and they tore up the letter of complaint about me. They're like, all right. But what about ketamine sequence intubation, KSI for trauma? Is it coming? I think KSI is coming for trauma. Um, 
it's sort of gathering a foothold in different places. So all the, all the trauma intubations in Australia are done with ketamine, all of them, all of them. And so KSI is coming along. The nice thing, if you do do KSI and you're moving quickly through your primary survey and other care, if you do do ketamine sequence intubation, obviously you can go right to procedures because the patient has adequate pain control at that point. And I'm interested in that. So there's some clean elements to this. And if it's neuroprotective and their head's not going to explode and purple smoke's not going to come out and their eyeballs aren't going to jump out of their head, then maybe it's okay. And so we're seeing lots more. This is, there's some papers in San Jose that are doing it and some other things. This is full dissociative dose ketamine uh, given IV and maintained. This is a paper, I love this paper, Revising Dogma. Really, that's in the title. And it just says level two evidence. Ketamine actually improves cerebral perfusion pressures, and it's possibly neuroregenerative and neuroprotective. So all this stuff about ketamine, bad for the brain, their head will explode, seems to be going by the wayside. No. I, who, was anyone at the storytelling last night? Anyone here? So I told a story. When I come home from work, you know, and you have a little bit of bile on your pants, maybe a few blood splatters. When I get home, my dogs, they, they're fascinated with that, man. They, it's, they notice everything. They're like, a little coffee ground emesis on the toe of your shoe. They're like, I'm going to eat that shoe later. That's really good. And then they sniff up the thing, and, and they, they, they're very confused by this when I come home with these body effluents on me. But, and, I, and I tell them. I don't want to tell them what I do, but I tell them when they do that. I look at them and I tell them, the alpha wolf hunts alone. <laughs> and I believe, I tell them that there's a caribou out back that I just brought up. And so they, that, that's, that's what happens. They respect me because they think that the alpha wolf hunts alone. So we'll end there. I'll take questions. I caught us up on time. <laughs>